When you initially see a site, your mind starts to develop thoughts and how this property could evolve into a golf course that would be both you know, a beautiful setting to provide a memorable golf experience, really enjoy the camaraderie of, of playing around a golf and, and being in a tremendous environment. That's the first part of it early on in the planning stages. And then once you finish the plans, you're visualizing the design, you put it down in two dimensions on a plan, and then when it starts to happen in the field and you see your vision evolve from the ground up, there's a tremendous amount of personal gratification when you can see that vision become a reality. That's a really fun moment. Golf course architecture, there's, it's an art and a science. The science is the part that you don't see. It's the underground, it's the drainage system, irrigation system, the soils, yeah. the turf. The art part of it is coming up with a palette of, of grass that is going to show contrast between the fairways, the rough, fescue areas, some of the native planting areas. And, and you have those areas uh, frame your view of the golf holes. So I think with a golfer, a lot of it is subconscious, the way they interpret it. You know, the vegetation, the tree plantings that you do. Sometimes you clear trees to accent specimen tree that's there that was hidden because there were too many other trees planted around it. Sometimes you, you'll plant a tree as a target tree. So when a golfer stands on the tee, they can say, that's my target to aim for to place the tee shot in the appropriate location. You know, when I look at a piece of property and, and see the beauty in it um, and try to preserve the integrity of what he created, and then if we have a piece of property that doesn't have those inherent physical features to preserve, we try to enhance it to exploit the dynamic between the game of golf and the land on which it is played. What are the pain points? <laughs> well, there are. So when we design a green, we try to um, define like five to six pin placement zones by providing that type of flexibility. If you've got a pin placement on the right side of the green here that's protected by the bunker, if you have knowledge of this slope in the green, you don't have to hit your approach shot directly over the bunker. You can use this slope. It's the most important feature on a golf course as far as playability and strategy and, and how you set the course up for uh, the different levels of golfers. Pretty clear from my standpoint, we're, we're given God-given talents and I was fortunate enough to experience and understand what mine was. The fescue will frame your view looking down the 18th hole. I do the best that I can on every project and it's to glorify him. When a golf course is done like this and you see the beautiful setting, there's a definite direct connection from Sunday to Monday. Hi, my name is Rick Jacobson. I'm a golf course architect, and there's work to be done. Good morning. I am so happy to be here with you this morning. I've missed you guys. It's really nice to be back in this place. Um, I do want to say hello to, to uh, my, my people at Highland Park, the, the friendly campus. I just want to say hi to them uh, really quickly. And, and I hope that the whole technology around the, the hologram that is, you know, it should be like, like I'm right there on the stage. If that's not working, just look at the screen and you'll be fine. But I also want to say hi to Crossroads and Vernon Hills as well. And um, I think that, that the memo went out to all the Lake Forest people, not to say anything about this, but I didn't get the memo. So I can say it's Pastor Mike's birthday today. So, yeah, so you need to text him or something like that, right? I mean, a lot of, a lot of you who have, have only been around for a little bit are going, like, who's this young kid they've got in the pulpit today, right? <laughs> We're used to the old guy. Like, where's the old guy, right? Um, I, actually, Mike is, is uh, a full eight months older than me. So I often go to him. I figure he learned a lot in those eight months. So I often go to him for godly counsel, as I would to a wise old sage. Um, but I actually have been married for a couple of months longer than Mike, so I often give him um, some marriage tips, you know, tips on being a good husband. It's the least I can do. I ask myself, what's the least I can do? And that was it. 
So uh, I'm so glad to be here talking to you today about this series, There's Work to Be Done. We're in our third week of it. We've been looking at how our relationship with God ought to transform the way that we think about our work, whatever that work is, whether it's our vocational work or our work with families or work in our communities, how ought we think differently? How should we think differently in light of our relationship with God about our work? And each week we've been looking at a psalm that points to an aspect of God's character, recognizing that that is also a value of the kingdom of God. Any aspect of the king's character becomes a value of their kingdom, right? I want us to think for a moment about Jesus' words to us when he was teaching us to pray. And he said, thy kingdom come. Pray like this. Pray this. Pray, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's think for that. Think about that for a moment. Thy kingdom come. What is God's kingdom? Well, God's kingdom is anywhere. God is ruling and reigning. So it's any place or person or group over which God is ruling and reigning. So it's when his ways and his values and his perspective are dictating the way that we're living, dictating our actions, Dictating our relationships. That's the kingdom of God. And then Jesus says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, what's heaven? Heaven is simply a fully realized kingdom of God. It's the consummated kingdom of God, fully here, completely aligned with God's plans and design where his ways are dictating everything. That's heaven. And so when Jesus teaches us to pray, saying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, this is not a call for us to just hold on as long as we can in this broken world and wait till we finally get to heaven. Jesus is saying, pray that God's kingdom would come now, here, he's saying, pray that our experience of earth would be as it should be eventually in heaven. And implicit in that is an invitation for us to participate with God, right? In his redemptive work in the world, his work of renewing and restoring the earth back to his original design. Implicit in his instruction to pray is an invitation to, to partner with God in that work. And that's exactly what this series is all about. The question being raised is, do you think about your work in that way? Do you think about your vocation as a partnership with God, ushering into the world the values of the kingdom of God? Do we think about our work in that way? Week one, Ben Dockery, Pastor Ben, um, talked about goodness as an aspect of God's character and a value of the kingdom of God and challenged us to think about ways that our work is bringing goodness into the world. Good products, good environments, Week two, last week, Mike talked about justice as an aspect of God's character and a value of the kingdom of God. And he challenged us to think about how our work might be making the world more just. Well, today we're talking about beauty. Again, as an aspect of God's character and a value of the kingdom of God. And we're thinking about how can we bring beauty into the world through our work. So first we're going to define beauty. I've, you know, I've got, um, I really don't have that, that, those, that big of an expectation this morning. We're just going to define beauty. That's all. 
What do we mean by it? Then we're going to talk about beauty as an aspect of God's character, how our God is filled with beauty. And then we're going to think about how can we bring that value of the kingdom of God into our broken world through our work. So, first of all, what is beauty? Well, it's important to stress here that we're talking about what beauty looks like in the kingdom of God. Because certainly there is a certain kind of surface cosmetic beauty that is valued in the kingdom where sin rules and reigns. What the Bible calls the world. That realm where sin nature dictates our actions and our relationships, and our attitudes. There, beauty is used often as a tool for self-promotion or personal gain or advancement. All of us know people who are are famous for being famous, right? They've used surface cosmetic beauty for their own personal advancement. They've surrounded themselves with things that this world's system might lift up as beautiful. But this is not what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about something deeper and more resonant than surface cosmetic beauty. We're talking about something more profound than that. So what is beauty? Well, just a few minutes ago, you were asked to greet each other and share the most beautiful place that you had ever seen. And my guess is it was probably not hard for you to think of a moment when you experienced sublimity, where you experienced a deep aesthetic experience with the sublime. Now, if I'd asked you to greet each other and please share with each other the definition of beauty, that might have been a little bit more difficult, right? It's hard to define but we know of its existence. Nobody said, what do, you, what do you mean? Like the most beautiful place that I've ever seen. What are you talking about? We all know of its existence and we've all experienced it. So a friend of mine shared uh, a moment when she and her husband went to, to visit the Grand Canyon. Uh, Sandra mentioned that the Grand Canyon was one of those moments for her. And this friend of mine says, they, they parked their car, they got out, they walked to the edge of the canyon And the two of them, she and her husband, just stood there for minutes in silence. And they finally looked up at each other, and both of them had tears streaming down their faces. What is that? What causes us to look at a rock and cry, right? There's something very deep in us that resonates with beauty. We're wired to respond to deeply aesthetic experiences. This is what we're talking about this morning. These deep, resonant, sensory, profoundly satisfying and pleasing experiences. That's beauty. Beauty is a quality that has no utilitarian purpose, no practical use. But it brings these deep, resonant, sensory, profoundly satisfying, profoundly pleasing experiences. And part of why these experiences feel right and good to us, even righteous to us, there's a rightness to beauty. It feels good and right. Is because beauty is a characteristic of the one who made us. It's a characteristic of our God. Everything he touches is filled with beauty. He can't help it, right? Everything he makes is filled with grandeur and majesty and vastness and intricacy and inventiveness. The thing is, the universe doesn't need to be beautiful. The entire universe is this beautiful, sustaining system that works together in this beautiful rhythm, right, and remarkable precision. But it could work without beauty. 
the physics of it would still work without beauty. There doesn't need to be, it doesn't need to be that colorful, that varied, that inventive. I mean, just think of one category of species for a moment. Let's think about beetles. Beetles are amazing. We have, a, I think, a, an image for us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are beetles with remarkably strange and ridiculously varied designs. There's huge variety of coloration and stripes and spots. Each one has different shape. Each one has different kinds of legs and a different armor and different pincers. There are over 350,000 species of beetles, and every one of them is distinct and unique. I mean, you just sense God's absolute pleasure in, in, in creation. Like, he, he started on beetles, and he was like, oh, my gosh, this is too much fun. <laughs> I want to I stay here for a little bit and develop this. This is, this is a blast. I mean, you just, I mean, talk about beetle mania, right? Okay. But there are also a huge variety of fish. But what blows me away about fish are the ones that are at the bottom of the ocean. Because it would be many millennia before any eyes, and so, so go, yeah, go to those. These are the ones that are at the bottom of the ocean. It would be many millennia before any eyes would ever see these things. It's like God put this little surprise for us at the bottom of the ocean. It's like he's saying, oh, I can't wait till they are able to get down there and see these. They're going to be blown away. Why is everything that God touches absolutely beautiful? What purpose does it serve? What benefit? I mean, beauty seems to have no practical utilitarian purpose. But Paul tells us in Romans 1 that it points to the divine. It points us toward God. So Romans 1, verse 20 says this. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and his divine nature, his essence of who he is, have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made. So in other words, there is something that we can understand about our creator and how amazing and beautiful he is just by what he placed in creation for us to see. He's given us an indication about his character. And remember, we're not talking about surface cosmetic beauty. Because actually, even the prophets, speaking of the coming of the Messiah, said he will have no beauty that we would want to desire. There's a different kind of beauty that is filled and emanating from our God. That everything he touches is filled with it. First Chronicles 16, 29 says, Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Psalm 29, 2 says the same thing. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Isaiah 4, 2. In that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious. Isaiah 28, 5 says, in that day, the Lord of hosts will be for a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty. Isaiah 33, 17, your eyes will see the king in his beauty. Psalm 52, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God will shine forth. I could go on and on. Beauty is a foundational character quality of our God. It's a part of who he is. It's his essence. It's what emanates from him, his beauty. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, he has made everything beauty, beautiful in its time. 
Now, I mentioned that each week we're looking at a psalm that points to a character quality of God. And today we're looking at Psalm 27. And that psalm speaks of the strength and deep satisfaction and joy and profound peace that comes from gazing at the beauty of God. So let's take a look at our passage for today, Psalm 27, verses 1 through 8. The psalmist writes, and this is a a psalm of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to do what? To gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face, your face, Lord, will I seek. Notice the context of this psalm. Notice the circumstances in which David writes the psalm. He says, the wicked advance against me. An army besieges me. War is breaking out around me. David is writing in the midst of dire circumstances. A very hard situation. But in the midst of all that, There is one thing, and in fact, he says, only one thing that I seek. (laughs) There's one thing that he asks of the Lord, and only one thing that he seeks. And what is that? To dwell in the house of the Lord and gaze on his beauty. Now, think about this. If beauty, as we've said earlier, has no practical utilitarian use, why in the world is this the thing that David asks of the Lord in this situation. I mean, you would think that he would ask for God's power, right? His vengeance, his justice, his protection. But to say the one thing I desire is to gaze on the beauty of the Lord is to say the thing that I desire is is him, Not not any benefit that I would get from him. Not any advantage that I would have because God's on my side. What I'm seeking is him. He is the benefit. It's simply his presence. To behold his beauty. In other words, his essence, the, the essence of who he is, his character, his nature, his beauty. And what was the result? In verse 6, it says, Then my head will be lifted up above my enemies. So in the midst of dire situation, dire circumstances, just to gaze on the beauty of the Lord, just to be in face-to-face intimacy with him, fills David with such joy, hope, peace, and perspective that he's able to lift his head up even in the face of his enemies. So is that the purpose of beauty? To direct our eyes to God so that we can see him and be filled with hope? In a dark world where the shades are coming down (laughs) all around you and you find yourself in darkness, is that the purpose of beauty? Well, 
In a certain sense, absolutely yes. Absolutely. Because there is no beauty that satisfies fully beyond the beauty of our God. The very existence of beauty and and the, the, the mere fact that we're wired to respond to it points us to the one greatest source of satisfaction. The one relationship that all of us were made for. But there's another sense in which beauty is just simply a gift. It's just a gift from God's heart. Because of who he is, just out of his goodness, he's put into this world beauty and he's made our hearts to respond to it. Let me give you an example of this. Um, So most of my academic training is, is in visual art. So I have sat in a lot of art history classes. And while I was taking those art history classes, there was a benefit for me to study these great works of art throughout history. I was getting a degree. I wanted to get a good grade. So there's a benefit to studying these great works of art. But sitting in a dark room looking at slides and memorizing dates and artists' names had not prepared me for the first time that I would actually walk into a museum and stand in front of something that would move me. See, I grew up in rural Ohio. I grew up in Bryan, Ohio. Bryan is the home of the Ohio Art Company, maker of the Etch-A-Sketch. And the Spangler Candy Company, maker of Dum Dum Suckers. I was born and raised in the Dum Dum capital of the world. Just explains a lot, I know. But believe it or not, you might, you might be surprised by this, but in the dum dumb capital of the world, there are no galleries or museums. So my first experience in a museum, I'd, I had recognized that there was something in me that resonated with creativity and making things. And so I was, I was an art major at Miami University, and I had never set foot in an art museum. First time was the Toledo Art Museum. And I remember standing in front of a Van Gogh painting for 40 years minutes, just moving in and out of the passages of paint, you know, moving from one brushstroke to the other, just looking over the whole surface of it. And at that moment, I said, this is what I want to do. I want to give people this kind of an experience. So when I was in those classes, beauty had a benefit. I'm sorry, There was a benefit to studying great art. But now, man, I I pay every year to renew my my membership to three different museums. I pay for that just for the sheer pleasure of standing in front of these objects of beauty. What we do as artists, designers, architects is crucial We bring life and joy and wonder into the world. We provide experiences with sublime aesthetic beauty, with this remarkable value, this gift that God's just implanted into the world. I love what C.S. Lewis says about friendship and art. He says, friendship is unnecessary, like philosophy, like art, It has no survival value. Rather, it is one of those things that give value to survival. Many of you have occupations that deal directly with aesthetics. Artists, musicians, graphic designers, interior designers, architects, landscape designers, and maintainers, chefs, and restaurateurs, furniture builders, furniture restorers. I know people in every one of those categories in our church. And those roles are dealing, oh, did I mention um, golf course designers, right? Every one of those deals directly with aesthetics, deals directly with this aspect of God's character and bringing this powerful quality into the world. And what you do in those occupations is valuable 
and critical and important for no other reason than bringing a value of the kingdom of God into this broken world. Helping us experience this gift that God has given to us. So I want to encourage you today to to see your work as deeply valuable simply because you are bringing into our broken world an aspect of God's character and a gift from the heart of our creator. But some of you might be thinking, well, I, I don't have a job like that. I deal with, you know, hard facts and numbers. So that's nice. And it's really nice to know the value of what they do, but um, I don't do that. Well, I want to suggest that there is a sense in which all of us have an opportunity to bring beauty into the world. In Exodus chapter 30, there's a character by the name of Bezalel, first individual that the Bible ever describes as having been filled with the Holy Spirit. And what did God fill Bezalel with the Holy Spirit for? He commissioned him to adorn the tabernacle with craftsmanship, elements of craftsmanship and artistic design. Now, each of those elements, none of them had any utilitarian purpose in the tabernacle. They were merely for adorning the tabernacle with beauty, for the beautification of the tabernacle. Now, why was God concerned that the tabernacle and then later the temple would be a structure of beauty? It's because the tabernacle and later the temple housed the presence of God on earth. And so the structure that housed the presence of God needed to reflect the beauty of its resident. And you might be thinking, well, that's, that's the Old Testament. That's the Old Covenant. Where does God's presence reside on earth now? Well, Paul tells us. He says in 1 Corinthians 6, he says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Paul is saying, previously it was the temple where the presence of God resided on earth. But now, it's our lives. Our lives house the presence of God on earth. And now it's our lives that ought to reflect the beauty of its resident. We need to be living lives that are winsome and attractive, that exude the beauty of the one who has taken up residence within us. Paul tells us in Titus 2.10 that when we live lives that align with God's ways and nature, we make the teaching of, our, of, our, of God our Savior attractive. Isn't that great? In this post-Christian culture, the world is not going to be saved by convincing arguments or rigid political ideologies. People are not going to be attracted to the gospel because we say, hey, we have the truth. We're owners of the truth. Come and join us. It's going to be as, as people see a life brimming over with the words and love and life of Jesus. It's when people see lives that are filled with beauty. It's when people see communities of beauty, communities that are living together in unity, serving compassionately, listening to each other, listening to others with humility and openness and love. This is how people will see the kingdom of God. Beauty is key in that. There's this phrase from Dostoevsky's book, The Idiot, where Prince Mishkin, this character that Dostoevsky tried to, to create that would be this guileless, good, perfect character, um, he, he says in, at one point in the book, beauty will save the world. And this is how that can, that can happen. When people see the beauty of God's people, 
It's how God saved me. You see, I was a freshman art major at Miami University, and there were these two guys in the art department, Chuck and Rich. They were excellent artists. They loved life. They weren't competitive like all the other art majors. They would come alongside you and help. There was something about their life that was winsome and attractive and beautiful. And that's what drew me to Jesus. May we be people whose lives reflect the beauty of the one who has taken up residence in us. May that come out through us in everything that we do. I'm gonna close with a prayer um, that Ben Dockery found for me. It's a prayer for artists. And so I'm just gonna pray this prayer that was written um, for, as a blessing over artists. And for those of you who are involved in that work, I want to bless you this morning in what you do. Father, we come before you to pray for the artists in our city. You are the original creator. All truth, all beauty comes from you. You brought forth the heavens and the earth as your medium to serve mankind. Father, you first poured out your spirit of creativity for the sake of honoring beauty and truth, for the sake of worship, for the sake of celebrating all that is good and just. We thank you for those who take part in this sacred dance of creativity, a process of surrendering and creating. The spirit is revealing your true nature through their work. May their hearts and hands always be aligned with authenticity and honesty. We pray that these artists can be the cultivators and storytellers of the richness of this life, drawing inspiration from the joys and the sorrows of our communities to create an honest reflection of truth and beauty. Let them continually awaken to your greater calling and continually shed the weight of selfish ambition and pride which the world tries to demand from them. Help them to surrender for the sake of what is good and just to the stories you want them to tell. In Jesus' name, amen.